Praise be Jesus Christ. I'd like to go ahead and start uh, this lesson um, off with the, um, the oratory uh, place of prayer book right here. And this is on page 37. It's the uh, prayer of St. Thomas Aquinas for purity. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Jesus, I know that every perfect gift, and especially that of chastity, depends on the power of your providence. Without you, a mere creature can do nothing. Therefore, I beg you to defend by your grace the chastity and purity of my body and soul. And if I have ever sensed or imagined anything that could stain my chastity and purity, blot it out, Supreme Lord of my powers, that I may advance with a pure heart in your love and service, offering myself on the most pure altar of your divinity all the days of my life. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, uh, this lesson is based on the uh, first Sunday of Advent, and this is the readings from Cycle A. Uh, we're going to actually take from the Gospel lesson, but also the second reading. Um, so, we'll start with the Gospel. This is Matthew 24, 37 through 44. Jesus said to his disciples, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. In those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day that Noah entered the ark. They did not know until the flood came and carried them all away. So it will, also, so it will be also at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be out in a field, one will be taken, and one will be left. Two men will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, and one will be left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on which day your Lord will come. Be sure of this. If the master of the house had known the hour of night when the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and not let his house be broken into. So too, you also must be prepared. For at an hour you do not expect, the Son of Man will come. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a few things um, I think is probably true that as a Catholic, every, every Advent season, the first, second Sunday of Advent, but mostly the first Sunday of Advent, we are given pretty much the general message that we need to be prepared. And, and typically we hear this message of be prepared, clean your house, get your house ready, get your heart ready to receive Jesus Christ. Not only Jesus Christ who sits on the throne of your heart, or you could even say the crib, the baby Jesus resting in the crib of my heart, but, but get your home ready because a divine guest is coming to our home. And so anytime a guest comes into our home, we want to, to be ready. Uh, we want to clean house. We want to prepare. And, and probably the greater the guest, uh, the more important the guest, probably the greater and the more thorough the cleaning. And I think this is also true of this message. This is a great message. And it is true that we should prepare our home, but this is also a very general message. And, and we need help sometimes in knowing what specifically to do. For instance, if I were to ask my wife, or if my wife were to say, um, hey honey, I'm gonna be uh, leaving the, home, the house for a little bit, um, but I, I want you to clean the house when I'm gone. Well, knowing myself, I would look around the house and I would say, oh, there's nothing here that needs to be cleaned. This looks great to me. Um, and so she would come back home She'd say, I asked you to clean the house. What's going on? And I would say, well, it looks great to me. Everything's great. Now, there's a big difference if she were to say before she leaves, um, honey, there's a, lot, there's a lot of dishes in the sink, and I want you to clean all of those dishes or put them in the dishwasher. Uh, there's some stains on the, on the toilet bowl. I want you to go ahead and, and uh, clean both of the, both of the bathrooms. Um, and I also expect you to make the, the, the kids' beds and uh, maybe clean up the playroom. Okay. And so very, very specific tasks now are given. It's not just the general clean your house, but it's wash the dishes, clean the toilet bowl, clean up the playroom, pick up all the toys off the playroom and make the bed. Now that's very specific. And I think what we need to hear sometimes, especially as Catholics and as sinful people, we need to know the specifics. And so especially in this time of Advent, you know, when we hear strong homilies that maybe say something like, you know, Hey, that target uh, uh, pornography or that uh, target you know contraception or target abortion. Some of these main things that that actually need to be 
rooted out um, of not only our society but of the individual hearts. This is important for us to identify these. So in this lesson, we're actually going to talk about some of these sexual sins that are um, plaguing our society. And and with this, um, we're going. And I, I want to also, I'm sorry, point to to one part of this scripture. We have to address these now because. As Jesus tells us in the scripture, we don't have time later, and we don't know how much time we have. We do not know the hour. The time is now. Um, I used to have a basketball coach in high school that would always say, woulda, coulda, shoulda. He would always say that to us. Anytime we would complain, well, well, coach, I was going to do it, or, or coach, I, you know, I thought about doing it. He would always say, woulda, coulda, shoulda, man. Woulda, coulda, shoulda. And, and, and that's, not, that's always stuck with me because that's, is that what we're going to try to say you know, this is what this gospel is saying. Be sure of this. If the master of the house had known the hour of night, and uh, he would have stayed awake. He would have. Would have, could have, should have stayed awake. That's where we're at right now with Advent. We would have. Are we going to say that to our, our Lord? Why didn't you root out this sin? Why, with the help of my grace, you were given this opportunity to get this sin out of your life? to get the garbage out of your life. And, and on our response, well, I would have done it. Well, I should have done it. Well, I could have done it. We don't want to be in that position that we're saying woulda, coulda, or shoulda to Christ. Now is the time. Well, would you? Now's the time. Will you do it? Could you? Of course you can with the grace of God. Should you? Yes, it's a directive of Christ. He's saying it. You should be holy. You should be perfect as my Heavenly Father is perfect. So not only can we, yes, of course we can. Not only should we, of course we should. And, and, and will you then? And that's the time. That's all of us. Will we do it? Will we stay awake? And, and will we fight our enemies? Um, so let's look a little bit. It says in, in this reference of the gospel, it says that it will be like the days of Noah. And we know that the days of Noah... You know, we're, we're obviously a time of sin, uh, a time of depravity, and, and, and mostly centered on violence and, and sexual sins. So we're going to look at Romans 13. This is the second reading for um, cycle A, the first Sunday in Advent. Romans 13, 11 through 14. So when we look at this, these words of, uh, of St. Paul to the Romans, we'll see very specifically what he's asking us to do here. Romans 13, 11. He says, And do this because you know the time. It is the hour now for you to awake from sleep. For our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is advanced. The day is at hand. Let us then throw off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us conduct ourselves properly as in the day, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in promiscuity, licentiousness, not in rivalry and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the desires of the flesh. This is a very strong language. St. Paul says, make no provision. Make no provision for the desires of the flesh. When we think of sins like pornography, that's all that sin does, is make provisions for the desire of the flesh. When we think of prostitution, when we think of masturbation, when we think of sexual promiscuity, all of those are, are, are the desires of the flesh. And, and completely just an all-out abuse of that. Um, so we're going to talk about these things, and we're actually going to go straight from the catechism with all of these. There will be catechism references for these. But, but what we want to do really is, is identify what are our enemies here? Uh, what are the enemies that, that we battle? And the church has always said, has always taught, that our enemies are three. Our enemies is the devil, Satan, the world, and the flesh. And this is what St. Paul is talking about in Romans. Make no provisions for the flesh. And this is actually the one that we're going to focus on now. Now, if you've watched the Chronicles of Narnia videos, you notice that the first movie is dealing with battling Satan, the White Witch, right? The White Witch is part of this, and there's a battle against this White Witch. In the second movie, the White Witch is, is non-existent, right? 
And, and so what's happening is in this in this second Narnia video, Narnia has been really taken over by by the bad the bad people, right? Um, by by the world, the, Narnia has become corrupt, and so there's this resistance against that corruption of the world. And then the third video, the White Witch is not there, and we see in the third video, the third movie that uh, actually um, uh, Narnia has, has had a sense of peace. It's a time of peace. But what's the battle? It's the battle of the flesh. Each character has to focus then on, on what is their struggle, whether it be vanity, whether it be uh, doubt, um, insecurities, whatever it may be, they have to struggle with these things. So what is it that when we talk about the flesh, the provisions of the flesh? It's obvious that, that one of the biggest problems in our time, as in the days of Noah, is that sexual um, sensations and, and misuse of sex. So we have to understand, okay, well, what, what is a misuse of sex? When we talk about a misuse, and we're not just talking about the sexual acts, but, but or, or not just sex itself as sexual intercourse, but, but, but sexual acts even, okay? The misuse. Well, to understand a misuse, we have to understand what is the use of sex, or we could say, what is the purpose of sex? To find that out, we have to ask really the person that created sex. You know, if, if, if I have a little gadget, maybe I have this marker, the best thing for me to do is to go to, if I want to know how to use this marker correctly, I would go to the person that made the marker. If I want to know how to drive a car, uh, I would go to the maker of the car. So in the same way, if we want to know how to use sex, all right, in other words, what is the purpose of sex? Then we have to go to God, who is the creator of sex. And it's very clear that what, what is sex according to God, according to the church? The sex is, is not only good, and what we mean by that is, in a sense, many times pleasurable. Okay. So good, pleasurable, but it's far beyond just a good, and it's far beyond just pleasure. It's actually holy. Okay. Um, and, and what is the purpose? The purpose of sex is twofold. Okay? It's the, the procreation. And it's the unity of a couple. And in our day and age, we can't just say couple. We have to add that it really means a married couple. And uh, unfortunately, also in our day, we have to define what this is because it's trying to be redefined. But this is one man and one woman. So what is the purpose of sex? The purpose of sex is procreation, the unity of a couple, and, and also what is one of the effects of sex? It's, it's obviously, um, it's also pleasurable, okay? So it's good, it's holy, it's pleasurable, and it has its purpose. This is the purpose of sex. This is what it is intended for. So a misuse would be anything that does not fit that category. Anything that goes against um, that goes against the procreation, and that goes against the unity of a couple. Okay, in the uh, we're going to be using the catechism here, and, and we'll go ahead and start with uh, 2351. Um, so if we go to 23, and, and all of these will be right here in this section. We start with 2351. It gives the definition of lust, and it says uh, lust is disordered desire for an inordinate or inordinate enjoyment of sexual pleasure. So obviously the church is saying that sex is pleasurable, but that doesn't mean that we can have an inordinate enjoyment of it. Sexual pleasure is morally disordered. Okay, so this is the order. The order of sex, properly ordered according to God. This, of course, would be the disorder. The misuse. And the misuse is what makes it sinful. Why? Because it's depriving the self of goodness, it's actually depriving the self of ultimate pleasure and happiness and depriving yourself of holiness. And so sexual pleasure is morally disordered when it's sought for itself, when it's isolated from procreation, and when it's uh, isolated from unitive purposes. With this, we can add a third thing here then. That it, that it, that it should be a gift of self not sought for self. And so, this is the ordered. When does it become disordered? Well, we can see, we can just put A, B, and C up here. 
to coordinate with one, two, three. If, if it's disordered, it means that it's not open to light. In fact, even it's, it's completely closed to life. The intention is not to bring forth life. The second is that it brings a disunity to a couple, or it's not a married couple. Okay? And then the last one is exactly what it says, that it's sought for itself. The action is sought for itself. So we can draw a line here, and then we can start to make a distinction. Mostly when we look at sexual activity in our society, is, it, is, it, um, is sexual activity in our society, is it procreative, unitive, and, and is it seen as the gift of self, or is it closed to life, not happening between a couple or breaking up couples, and is it sought for itself? This is very clear. C is very clear because, you know, uh, Pope Emeritus Benedict, what he said, Benedict XVI said that, um, I think in his encyclical on love, he said that sex has become a commodity which is bought and sold. Okay? People have been objectified and are being objectified. So we're going to go through, step by step, a few of, um, really a few of the things that the Catechism talks about. And, and, and step by step, ask the questions of, is this ordered or disordered and why? Okay, so the first one, I'll go ahead and put these over here. And this is the sections, this is 2352 in the Catechism. And the first one is, is, is masturbation. Okay. 2352. The second one that the, the catechism will talk about is fornication. Fornication is the carnal union between an unmarried man and an unmarried woman. Okay? We're going to go ahead and talk about 2354 is pornography. Twenty three fifty five is prostitution. Twenty-three fifty-six is rape. Twenty-three fifty-seven is homosexuality. I'll put homosexual acts. Um, okay. So here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, and this is all under lust. These are all lustful things, not loving things. And when we talk about cleaning the house, uh, as, as I spoke before, you know, this is being very specific now. It's not just saying, hey, get your life in order. It's actually pointing to some of these things where St. Paul says, make, make no provision for these things. Do not allow these things. Why do we not allow these things? Because these actions, okay, masturbation, fornication, pornography, prostitution, rape, and, and homosexual acts are intrinsically evil, okay? They are evil. Um, they are never allowed. In fact, to commit these with full knowledge and full consent is to commit a mortal sin and separate yourself from the body of Christ. And if to stay in these sins with full knowledge and full consent, to stay in those sins is to damn our soul to hell. Um, we do not want to stay in these sins. We want to get out of them as soon as possible. So we do not want to make provisions for the flesh. We know that these are our enemies, because we know that our enemy is Satan, the world. And we think about that. All of these come from Satan. He is the one. He is the, the father of lies. He is the one that wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And each one of these sins will still kill and destroy our lives and the lives of those around us. And so these are definitely from Satan. Why do we know they're from Satan? Because Satan always attacks what is good, pleasurable, and holy. If you want to find out where, a priest once said this, if you want to find out where the unholy trinity is, find out where the trinity is, the holy trinity. Because Satan will always attack what is most good, most true, most holy. That's why he attacks the Catholic Church, because it's the bride of Christ, and he knows it to be true, full of grace, and holy. 
He will also attack sex because he knows it's good and it's holy. And he will attack marriages and therefore attack family and society. So this is of Satan. The world is per perpetuating these lies. Uh, the world has already embraced masturbation. This is considered the norm. This is considered okay. This is even considered sometimes healthy. All right. The, the world has, has allowed and made provisions for fornication. Premarital sex is, is simply sometimes okay now. Um, pornography is a major industry in our society, and, and, it, and, and it's, it's allowed. Um, prostitution is obviously allowed, and in some places it's even taxed. It's even um, you know, used as revenue for, for the government. Rape is probably the only thing on this list. Homosexuality is not only, um, in a sense, uh, welcomed, but homosexuality is even glorified in a sense, and even wanting to be made up to a, a status of, of legal approval. Um, the only thing probably in this list that is not acceptable is rape. But who's to say that that one one day won't be accepted just as the others? Because there was one point in our society where some of these others would never be a thought of being accepted. So, are we in the days of Noah? Well, it, we definitely see that these six intrinsic evils that are blatantly spoke of um, as, as contrary to God's will by the church are embraced by our society, a world of lies and a world of deception. So we know that Satan is, is, is the one driving this. Okay, We know that this is perpetuated by the world and its lies. But ultimately, there's an inclination sometimes in us to commit these sins. No one can force us to commit these sins, especially if we say, I would rather die than commit this sin. Okay, So it takes us and not battle against the flesh. We have to battle against the flesh first. And as St. Paul says, we make no provisions. We wake up and we clean our house. We clean our house of these evils. Um, with all of this, let's just go through pretty simply a, a kind of a starting point of, of how we could go ahead and explain why is it that masturbation deprives us of goodness, holiness, and, and, uh, and is a misuse? Well, let's, let's talk about this. It's not open to night. It's not open to life. In other words, procreation can't take place because of it. Um, it is, it is, um, it's not the couple together. It's an act that's done alone, right? And, um, and then it's, it's sought for itself. It's a selfish act. It's not the gift of self. It's a selfish act. Fornication. Okay, the, the carnal union between an unmarried man and an unmarried woman. Is it, is it open to life? Probably a, a 16, 17, 18 year olds that are um, wanting to uh, sexually be active and have sexual intercourse, the one thing they're probably thinking when they're together is, man, I hope we have a child tonight. <clears throat> you know, someone's on their prom night, someone goes on a date, whatever. You know, and they're probably not thinking that one of their goals by being together is that the little baby is going to be born nine months from then. And in fact, they're probably doing everything they can to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, it is not, by definition, a couple. Um, it's not a married couple. That's why it's called fornication. And it is sought for self. It may be um, one person is seeking it and the other person is mutually, so it's a mutual gratification, but it is sought for itself. Many times objectifying another person. Pornography. Um, the act of pornography is obviously an action that is completely void of, of the goodness because it's an action that's done not with the intent of unity of a couple, not with the intent of procreation, and it's completely selfish because of the gratification that's taking place, separate from all of these things. But also it has another component that it's, a, it's, it's the selling of a third party for, uh, it's a complete objectification of those people and not only is it sought for self as, as pleasure, but it's also sought for self and greed because it's done for money. So pornography is, a, is especially evil for all of these reasons. And you think how, how it's not even logical because someone that is, we talk about the objectification of the person. Uh, John Paul II, he said a great quote in regards to pornography. He said, the problem with pornography is that it doesn't show enough. What does he mean by that? It doesn't show that this, these people that you're watching, right? It doesn't show that they're a mother or a daughter or a son or a father 
or an uncle or an aunt or a cousin. It doesn't show the person. It objectifies the person. It uses the person. And, and you know, for, for instance, anyone that's addicted to pornography, anyone that, that has been involved in pornography and watched pornography, would that same person, you know, maybe a married couple that watches pornography together, would they call up their friends? Would they call up their neighbors and invite their neighbors over to do those same acts in their living room? Would they call their friends up and ask them to come over to their house in their bed and do those same actions so that they could just sit back and casually watch? No, you wouldn't want to watch real people, but of course, we're not watching real people, are we? We're watching people on a screen. We're watching make-believe people. No, the fact is those are real people and they are being filmed and they are being filmed committing sins for our pleasure um, and, and, and for all the wrong reasons. So, pornography obviously fits all these. Prostitution. Once again, prostitution, the intention is not uh, procreation. Um, it, not only does it not involve a married couple, but it also separates a um, married couple as, as well as pornography destroys marriages. Um, rape, the same thing. Rape is not, oh, the goal is not life. The goal is not the unity of a couple. In fact, because of this grave violation against another person, it, it, it's, it's, it's opposite of unity. Um, and then it is sought for itself. It's sought for itself at the expense of another. Um, and then homosexual acts. Homosexual acts, by their nature, um, are disordered, okay? It's a, it's a disordered um, orientation. And the actions themselves, okay, so the, the, the orientation is disordered, the action is evil. Um, why is it evil? Because an evil is a deprivation of good, and it's a deprivation of holiness. So it is sinful, it is evil. Um, the homosexual acts, by their nature, cannot be open to life. No one can be conceived from two men. Or two women. Um, it can never, let me stress this, homosexual acts can never be between a married couple because homosexuals can never be married. Okay, so A and B is for sure, and it's sought for itself. Once again, this kind of goes back to fornication. That is, it is a mutual use of each other for sexual pleasure. Um, it, it can't truly properly give the gift of self um, in these relationships. So, in this time of Advent, I hope that this will be, you know, it's a time that we can really look at our enemy, Satan, the world, and the flesh, that as we can heed the advice of St. Paul, making no provisions for the flesh, which is one of our enemies, and especially in our day and of age, which is most likely probably pretty similar to the days of Noah, that we will root out these sexual sins in our society, that we will share um, this teaching with others and those that struggle with these sins, ourself and others that struggle, can, can really help each other, lift each other up and say that, look, I don't want you just to clean the house, I want you to clean these certain areas. And, and my hope and my prayer is that as individual souls, as marriages, as families and as a society in general, we can get these things plucked out of our society. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.